I'm Joe Devine and welcome to the TIFO Football Podcast. Today I'm joined by Ben Roberts, writer of Gunshots and Goalposts, the story of Northern Irish football, and of our YouTube miniseries of the same name. I spoke to Ben about football in Northern Ireland during the Troubles, and for our listeners who maybe aren't from the UK or who aren't aware of what we refer to as the Troubles, I'm going to quickly read a synopsis as well from an article on the BBC's History Archive, just to make sure I'm getting it right. The Troubles refers to a violent 30-year conflict framed by a civil rights march in London Derry on the 5th of October 1968 and the Good Friday Agreement on the 10th of April 1998. At the heart of the conflict lay the constitutional status of Northern Ireland. The goal of the Unionist and overwhelmingly Protestant majority was to remain part of the United Kingdom. The goal of the Nationalist and Republicans, almost exclusively Catholic and also a minority, was to become part of the Republic of Ireland. This was a territorial conflict, not a religious one. At its heart lay two mutually exclusive visions of national identity and national belonging. The principal difference between 68 and 98 is that the people and organisations pursuing these rival futures eventually resolved to do so through peaceful and democratic means. This ascendancy of politics over violence, though, was not easily achieved. During the Troubles, the scale of the killings perpetrated by all sides, Republican and Loyalist paramilitaries and the security forces, eventually exceeded 3,600, and as many as 50,000 people were physically maimed or injured, with countless others psychologically damaged by the conflict, a legacy that continues to shape the post-1998 period. So that's a short synopsis of what we refer to as the troubles in this episode. Uh, Firstly, I did ask Ben to expand on that slightly on the background of that period. A little bit later on, we get into talking more specifically about football and some of the clubs that we cover in the YouTube series, including Belfast Celtic and Linfield. And also at this point, I should note that if you're interested in finding out more about this, then you can, of course, purchase Ben's book, Gunshots and Goalposts, the story of Northern Irish football. It can be found online or you can go to Ben's website. At the end of this podcast, he does reel off a few places where you can pick it up. Uh, The one he forgot to mention, though, was that if you live in Northern Ireland, uh, you can buy it in Waterstones. So that's exciting, too. Anyway, that's all before we get started. So thanks very much for downloading, and we hope you enjoy the podcast. Ben, can you uh, first give us a brief history of the Troubles in Northern Ireland? Sure. So what we refer to now as the Troubles um, kind of came around in the the mid to late 60s. In the late 1910s and early 1920s, Belfast had had its its first Troubles and, and they were known as the Troubles for for a little while. Um, but the, the modern day Troubles came about in, I mean, it's it's one of those things that... Um, you know you ask one person and they'll tell you one thing and somebody else will tell you something slightly different but generally speaking you can see an uptick in sort of sectarian tension and Mm. um, protests Uh, around 1965-1966 you had the re-emergence of uh, loyalist paramilitary organizations Uh, so the the UVF which had essentially been dormant for the best part of 40 years a guy called Gusty Spence um, brought that back into existence um, in I mean ostensibly he would say to to protect um, loyalists or uh, unionists protestants from perceived threat from from their neighbours um, obviously that would be disputed um, the other thing that you had going on which was seen as another catalyst for the troubles was um, that Catholics and nationalists were were quite badly discriminated against in in Northern Ireland. The Ulster Unionist Party had 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 ruled Northern Ireland pretty much as a as a sort of fiefdom for for the best part of fifty years, um, and hadn't really seen fit to kind of sort out the discrimination in employment. The electoral boundaries were horribly horribly gerrymandered. Um, mm. So majority Catholic districts and towns would have, you know, 10 unionist councillors and two Catholic councillors and and so on. So it, there, there hadn't been much of an effort to, to address that. Um, then the 
the, 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 the Ulster Unionists um, then found themselves with a leader, um, Terence O'Neill, who wanted to do something about some of the worst excesses of this um, and figures like um, Ian Paisley um, and to, to and others to a certain extent didn't want this to 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 change basically um they 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 wanted that that the the situation as it had been for for about 50 years to to stay the same um and so they they made sure that that terence o'neill and other reformers within the ulster unionist party couldn't um you know make changes in education and uh electoral the electoral situation um and this this kind of culminated in yeah those new those um the reemergence of those paramilitary organizations um and then on the sort of catholic nationalist side um the emergence of the uh, civil rights campaign um which um was was intended to have a sort of more broadly um you know non sectarian um approach um mm. but, it, but it ended up um you know being seen um largely by protestants as a as a as a sort of nationalist um republican thing um uh, in in part because that's who was mostly supporting it and and it was catholics that were that were most um discriminated against in the labor market i mean not that the labor market was a was a was a great um place for for working class protestants either um so uh so that that kind of um all fed into to this this growing sectarian situation which which by sort of 1969 1970 had had led to to rioting um in in belfast and derry um and the the british government um who so the northern irish parliament was responsible for lots of things in northern ireland um but the the government in westminster still had certain responsibilities and and it was at that point um after um you know they'd seen what was going on um with the northern irish police force which was then the ruc on the streets uh, particularly of derry that that they thought that this sort of other force, the British Army, might might be able to to um, right. sort that situation out. Which um, at first the the British Army were were um, seen by a lot of Catholics as a as a sort of uh, I mean not welcomed with open arms, but seen no. as as a sort of um, well, this has got to be better than the RUC. Um, okay. And, that that kind of was the case for for you know a, a few weeks um and then and then uh, the situation kind of uh, descended again and and the british army had gone from being seen as as this kind of um placating force to to actually one of kind of strife and and internment mm. were they seen as 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 almost an occupying force in some ways yes yeah um i i think for the, as I say, for, for, you know, a very short period of time, it was like, oh, well, you know, these guys will just be here for a little, little while just to make sure that the RUC, you know, kind of just rein them in a little bit. And, uh, mm. you know, hopefully then we'll sort out how, how Northern Ireland's governed and, you know, we'll, we'll have a fairer electoral system and, mm. and then we'll have a better police system and we won't need the British army here. Um, but, uh, but you know the 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 army came over and then they they started interning um largely catholics some some protestant paramilitaries but largely catholics in in camps without trial um and it was really that 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 it was it was one of those sort of points in history where you think well actually you can you can pinpoint um, a, a specific action and say well if if they'd taken this different approach this probably wouldn't have happened or it wouldn't have happened to this extent and it was really uh the the, the british army coming over um at the end of the 60s early 70s that that gave 
um, the the IRA, which had been in existence, of course, but it gave the IRA a sort of PR victory um, and a new impetus um, because they they actually had something to to point to and say, you know, look what's going on here, and you know, legitimately bad stuff was going on. Um, whereas you know the the ira had had very unsuccessful cam- a very unsuccessful campaign um you know not not at all popular campaign um between 1956 and 1962 and it it failed to shift sort of public opinion even on the on the nationalist side so it was it was one of those those uh, classic um sort of british british army british government uh, you know, making a, a British cock up. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's uh, let's bring it around to, to football now, because um, in the first video in the mini series that, that we're making, uh, it was focusing on on Belfast Celtic. You write that uh, the existing tensions between Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland found an outlet in football. Uh, do you think this is a special case, or do you think that this is the part? Uh, you know, this is part of a role of football as a popular sport to facilitate the surrounding social context i think sport can often be be a a a fairly um innocuous outlet for for tension um and and you know people can kind of let off some steam and 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 sort of express themselves in a way that um that is is not particularly harmful or damaging um on the other hand it, it can exacerbate those existing tensions yeah. and and, uh, and I think when the tensions are so deep rooted um and so pervasive um as they are in in a context um like Belfast and Northern Ireland and Derry and you know other other parts of Northern Ireland um then then uh, you know that that can that can become something that in lots in, in lots of ways um makes makes the situation um worse than it than it was and and yeah um you know that that was certainly the case with with um Belfast Celtic who you know found that um it it was best uh, shortly after the first world war for them to to leave um the Irish league for a period of time and then come back and then and then leave the Irish league altogether, which you know was not entirely down to sectarianism. There seemed to be a lot of money mysteriously disappearing from their coffers. Um, so there's you know and everything you read about is is incredibly elusive. Somebody knows what went on, but um, yeah. uh, I think there was obviously some directors that were perhaps. Um, taking some money out of the club right um, okay however you know were it not for the sort of sectarian situation then then having the club on a on a sort of more sustainable footing um you know would have would have been more straightforward um and uh, you you wonder how how a club like Belfast Celtic um playing where they did um would have you know, if they'd been in existence, still been in existence 20 years later in 1968 um, or 30 years later in 1978, yeah. um, it probably would have been a, an impossible situation. Mm. Mm. Uh, it's interesting to, to try and examine the the responsibility that football might have when it comes to difficult social contexts like this, because there's lots of examples throughout history um, of it being a sort of positive force in a difficult situation, and you know, I think the the, the obvious example of that is uh, the match uh, on Christmas Day during World War One, uh, when both sides, well, I suppose all three sides, came together to play play a game of football, and then the next day went went back to killing each other. But obviously, there there are examples in in the videos here, uh, the Belfast Celtic and Linfield game in 1948. Uh, where the tension sort of bubbled over and football served as a as a negative outlet for it. What do you think football's responsibility is? I know it obviously comes down to governing bodies, um, but what do you think football's responsibility is and, and when can we decide when it's best uh, not for it to, to, to be happening or when it's better for it to be happening, if that makes sense? 
Yeah, I mean, it's a tricky one um, because, you know, if if both teams want to play, then you feel who, you know, who is anybody else to tell them um, mm. that they, they ought, ought not to. And you, you had a situation a bit later um, in Belfast where there was a what was then a, a sort of a fully amateur side rather than a, a semi-professional side as as um, as the rest of the clubs in Northern Ireland are. Um, by the name of Donegal Celtic, um, who are another uh, more uh, recent club from West Belfast, who um, were, were drawn to, to play um, a uh, an, an Irish Cup game um, in in the sort of early nineties, and uh, it was supposed it was supposed to be played at their own ground um but it was dictated by the RUC that they couldn't play at their own ground and the players voted um that they wanted to play the game um but then the and the the governing bodies were happy for the game to be played um but you you had a situation where um perhaps some uh, uh some some paramilitary voices were were sort of whispered in their ear and said look you know we, we don't want you to be playing this game. Uh, you know, we don't want... Uh, it, it was a game... So the RUC compete um, in in uh, in sort of Irish um, football and and it was suggested um, by... That, that certain players had been sort of visited and said, well, you know, we can't guarantee your safety, um, you know, if you play this game. And then publicly... Um, from from the sort of Sinn Fein point of view, Jerry Adams had had basically said, you know, we can't um, we can't say that they shouldn't play this game, but but no nationalist and no Democrat should should be involved. So you you right. have all these competing um, voices, you know, even when the governing body says no, 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 it's fine, this game can go ahead. We just you know it should be played here and not here because we can't police this bit very well mm. um then you had a situation and one of those players who'd who'd uh the the team took a vote and i think it was like 23 to one in the squad that, that they should play it. and one of those players um uh a few years before had um his his father um had had been uh I think killed by the RUC, and even he wanted to 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 play the game. Um, right. Yeah. So uh, you know, you, you you had this very um, tricky situation where where you know you'd you'd have almost everybody in agreement that the game should should go ahead, but but then one one voice would would say actually, no, we don't think it should go ahead, and and because mm. the situation was so fraught you know just just that one that one piece um being being taken out of the the sort of very complex jigsaw meant that that going ahead with with games like that just just wasn't wasn't viable it must have been difficult for the players as well in in those cases and you know there's the story of Jimmy Jones which crops up in the Belfast Celtic video um being the last player from you know the safety of the tunnel at the end of the game between Belfast Celtic and Linfield and being attacked by a sort of riotous crowd and having his leg broken. Um, you mentioned in, in the video that he was a, a Protestant playing for uh, a team that would be more closely associated with, with Catholic uh, nationalism. And so I think it, it must be it must have been very difficult for, for footballers if they, you know, purely if they wanted to, to play football to be surrounded uh, by this, I suppose... You know, swaying, swaying of responsibility and power that they had no control over, and that they were subject to, like everybody else in in Northern Northern Ireland at the time. Yeah, and and that's why, particularly after the Second World War, um, you didn't have too many examples of players playing for for a club from the opposite side of the tracks, if you like. Yeah. It'd been a bit more commonplace um, between the First and Second World War, so you did have. Uh, a few Catholics that were involved uh, with Linfield, um, you know, that Linfield in the early 90s, um, under a certain amount of pressure, produced a, a list of Catholics who'd played or been involved with Linfield throughout their history. Um, I think in about 1992 and, and throughout their history, they, there was about 70 
such names um but almost all of them uh were from before the second world war um you you also had examples of of uh of protestant players um or, or players sort of perceived to be from a protestant background to protestant areas um like Ballymena or, or east belfast who played for Derry city um as uh, the events that we we discussed a few minutes ago were unfolding who uh who then you know decided that perhaps that wasn't um the the sort of best um thing that they could be doing for the, for themselves and their families um you know under often under a certain amount of pressure from their their families back home um who were who were getting uh, grief from from their own neighbours. So you know sometimes that 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 sort of uh, criticism, if you like, was was coming from from their own and the sort of inverted commas their own side, um, mm. which was the case of of uh, another Belfast Celtic player um, who played in the same side as Jimmy Jones. Uh, I think by the name of Harry Walker, um, who. Uh, who was from a unionist family and and after the uh Belfast after Belfast Celtic had um played their final match in the Irish league they they went on a tour of the United States and and they were paraded around a pitch i think in New York behind an Irish flag um and these sort of images eventually made their way back to Belfast and right. and uh you know, it caused there was five or six Protestants playing for or within the Belfast Celtic squad, and and it, it you know it didn't it didn't make their lives easy um, by any stretch of the imagination. And then you had even players um, uh, like Terry Cochran, uh, who is a Protestant, and he was playing for Linfield, and he talks in his autobiography about how when he got married um, in the early seventies. Um, he he got married. Well, he he puts it very tactfully in his autobiography. But he says, "I got married to somebody, and because she was a, of a different denomination, they asked me to <laughs> to leave the club." And you know, you you just left to read between the mm. the wide open lines there of, and and you know that was that was because of who he'd married. Um, so that was that was the 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 sort of the reality of of the situation. Well, let's talk about uh, religion. I think that that brings us onto it. And well, actually, first, f- f- to satisfy my own, my own curiosity, presumably, um, I don't know a great deal about the the history of Ireland, but presumably, the the original uh, split was as a result of of religion. Is that right? Yes. I mean, you've you've had throughout Irish history, there's been there's been sort of movements um, that have involved um, ostensibly sort of. Uh, a large amount of Protestants and Catholics working together. So the United Irishmen Rebellion in 1798 um, was was uh, uh, with Wolf Tone was was something that that sort of Presbyterians and Catholics got together on um, mm. against the the sort of basically the the Church of Ireland and the sort of uh, more established Church. But um, but but you know those those kind of moments of of working together um have, have obviously largely been overshadowed by by the uh the much longer periods of time where where protestants and catholics have have been in in conflict and and so mm. you know the protestants have tended to come um especially presbyterians from from scotland mm. Um, and then Church of Ireland types had come from England and they were um, sent over to Ireland to sort of try and quell what was seen as a as a sort of restive population um, right. that, that needed to be brought under control. So um, so the, the, the far, farms were given to, to English Protestants and Scottish Protestants um, to say, you know, you, you kind of come and settle this place. Um, and and bring it bring it under control in effect and mm. and uh, um, you know we can see you know the the sort of legacy of that today um, and 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 none more so in in Ulster which was seen as the most rebellious um, of, of Ireland's four provinces 
um, and and therefore, um, you know, was was the most sort of heavily um, colonized um, right. through the through the centuries, um, and and so obviously this this led to um, a, a quite understandable amount of tension because people were having their their land just just taken away from them um mm-hmm. it was it wasn't that there was no catholic landowners but it was very hard to be a catholic landowner um um and and so it was much harder um to 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 just survive as a catholic yeah. you know on a day to day level um you know just having enough to eat and and being able to to farm enough to to support yourself and your family um so it's not as as you know it's sometimes thought well you know how can how can they disagree over these tiny points of doctrine and you know because there are kind of doc, doctrinal differences but it it, you know it, it, the the actual quote unquote religious aspects of it in in terms of how religion is practiced um are, yeah. are sort of they're there but they're they're secondary well that's the thing i think it, you know it, it sounds like it's more about uh oppression than it than it really is about the religion you know i think i think religion sort of plays plays into it in an obvious way um but veering away from from football slightly for a moment um i remember having a conversation with a friend of mine who uh, visited Belfast for the first time this year and uh, his take on it was was very interesting he um you know made an effort to sort of wander around the city and walk into scary looking pubs and talk to you know people fr- from I suppose uh both sides of, of the coin um and he, he recalled one conversation with uh an older gentleman who was uh, was a Catholic and was uh, in a nationalist area but eventually when they, they got talking this man said to him that you know he used to he used to hate the English and he used to think that you know the the English were the source of all his all of his problems and then in the seventies and the eighties he saw Margaret Thatcher on TV talking about the miners' strikes and he realised that you know what the the English weren't his enemy it was it was I think wealthy people regardless of their uh, regardless of their nationality or people who would seek to you know oppress others that were that were the issue not you know english uh, english people as a whole and i found that i found that conversation very interesting and it sort of struck me then that you know that the 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 situation is less about anything specifically regarding religion or or wealth or anything like that but potentially about years of oppression you get to this point now and you, you you combine that with football and it's very it's very difficult to as you said it's very difficult to answer the first question giving us a brief history because depending on who you ask you'll get a different story and uh, i think it's it's very difficult to 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 answer this question but but when religion is thrown into the mix of that let's say uh, you know within the within the confines of a football ground when religion is thrown into the mix do you, do you think that it that it adds a further stress to those the tensions or or is it all just part of of, of tribalism all in all in different forms I, I think you you can see from the example of of places like Belfast, but also places like Glasgow, it it, it definitely adds a, a further tension, and it, it goes beyond the sort of. Um, I mean, obviously, you, you know, through the seventies, eighties, uh, perhaps even just early nineties, you you had trouble at English grounds uh, with hooliganism. Um, so it, it's not that that England was completely immune to any trouble at grounds, but it didn't have this, this extra element um, to it, um, which actually interests... And what is that about, though? Is, is that about the, the, the history of those people, or is, it, is that about their religious belief? I, I, I would personally say it was about the history um, mm. of, of those people and, and, and kind of uh, growing up very separately, um, both on an individual basis and and then on a sort of institutional basis as as well. So, in in effect, you don't have one civil society in in Northern Ireland. You have two very separate civil societies that 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 have different sort of not not so much these days different institutions because the Good Friday Agreement has has kind of um brought some of that into into line but but very mm. diff- just very different um sort of uh expectations 
um, and di- different methods of, of schooling, even today, you know, schooling, um, which is the case in Scotland to a, to a, a slightly lesser extent. But, um, you know, in, in Northern Ireland, t- still to a very great extent, um, is, is just c- almost completely segregated schooling. OK, well, if that's the case, today, let, let, let's update everything else. It's, it seems generally... Uh, maybe maybe I'm wrong, but it seems generally like a slightly more relaxed state of affairs. Um, you know, in 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 the script on on a forthcoming video uh, on Linfield, Northern Ireland's most successful team, um, and also often closely associated with uh, the unionist movement, that the team now has a, a Catholic captain. It, um, it, well, yeah, I mean, it it had its first Catholic captain in 2011, I think. Right, um, okay. he plays for somebody else now. But yeah. Oh. That's poor research on my part, but there you go. <laughs> it's still the same sentiment, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Um, but that does seem like a like significant progress given the history of segregation within the league. Um, what is the current state of the league with regards to any existing tensions? And also, I wanted to ask, you know, has the atmosphere uh, at all resurfaced with the advent of Brexit or with the DUP's position in in the current British Parliament? I th- I think it's it's important to to recognise that in terms of the playing staff of, of teams like Linfield, which until the early 90s, so from the late sort of 40s to the early 90s, the, you know, there was perhaps two, three Catholics that were involved with Linfield um, in, in any capacity. So their physio um, during the sort of 50s um, was a Catholic and they had a Hungarian Catholic um, who'd who'd fled uh, the uprising in Hungary in 1956? Um, who played for Linfield Swifts, which is the name of Linfield's second team, for a couple of seasons. Um, but they ha- had almost no Irish Catholics or, or Northern Irish Catholics, if you um, prefer that term, um, in their sort of setup for about 45 to, to 50 years, um, mm. and then uh, 1992. Um, kind of saw a certain amount of criticism of of Linfield for uh, for that um I think as as the um the video kind of goes into um from from outside of Ireland from the United States mm-hmm. and uh, and Linfield um had said well actually we you know we've never had an official policy and and it's true they'd never had an official policy um there was perhaps more more of a even calling it an unspoken policy um, would uh, raise certain hackles. But mm. I think what Linfield would themselves say, uh, and this isn't a, a defence or a, or a criticism of Linfield, but you know they'd say they'd they'd perhaps wanted to to sign Catholics um, or nationalists before that, but it would have made life very hard for those individuals as well. Um, yeah. So, shortly after they they put out a statement with with words to that effect, they did try and sign a guy uh, who played for was playing for Cliftonville. Um, I think he was called Jim McFadden, something uh, similar to that. And and he said, "Look, you know where I live, um, which was in the New Lodge in North Belfast. It, it wouldn't work for me um, yeah. to to play for Linfield. You know, I, I live in this area where." My, my life would be very difficult if I did that. People from my own community would be asking questions about why why I was doing that. Um, a, a few, not you know, not more than a few months uh, after that, Linfield did uh, manage to to sign a Catholic player, um, and that was then followed by their first um, Catholic signing from the Republic of Ireland. Um, which was something that they they hadn't done for about half a century, um, and and now you know you'd you'd uh, I honestly could barely tell you the the sort of quote unquote religion, and I suspect very few of them go to church anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, of of the Linfield team now, um, uh, but but you'd you'd find a, a, a fairly balanced team. So what tends to be the demarcation. Um, within within Irish league football today um, is uh, as it always has been, uh, but 
but without the sort of player aspect but but which which team you, you know you can support um and which, which team uh t- you tend to gravitate to depending on um you know which part of the city you grew up on yeah. um, and which part of the city you grew up in you know is largely whether you call yourself a protestant or a catholic mm. um you know whether you're practicing in in it, as a as a protestant or a catholic is is another question but you know yeah. the, those words have have a slightly different and sort of elevated meaning um in in northern ireland and what about with uh with brexit going forwards and with uh the northern irish party the dup now holding a, a more significant position within the british parliament has has that reignited any tension in the country well uh, i mean to to paraphrase a quite famous jerry adams quote it it never went away, you know. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, which he said about um, the IRA, which was one of his sort of more ill-conceived um, post Good Friday remarks. But um, you know th- that that kind of stuff is, has never fully gone away. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's just become less pronounced and and, yeah. and less sort of uh, egregious. Um, you know, pe- people who. Um, saw anything from the the um, sort of pre qualifying Champions League um, game between Linfield and and uh, Celtic earlier yeah. this year would have seen it's not so much in the chanting anymore because you know with the with the chants you know you, you, you're sort of putting yourself on it's a bit more of a a bit more of a limb but it's kind of the banners that are that are hung up around the ground and that sort of thing that that can still um you know there, there's still things that you would see at, at games uh in in the irish league that that you wouldn't see in in most english grounds or most scottish grounds yeah. um and yeah. you've still got sort of situations where you know when when uh, that that game at, at Windsor Park between Linfield and Glasgow Celtic had had finished uh, a, a Celtic player uh, I think it was Lee Griffiths tried to go and tie a Celtic scarf to the the post at <laughs> Windsor Park um, yeah. because Glasgow Celtic were a sister club of Belfast Celtic and obviously mm-hmm. came from that that same um, sort of uh, uh, Catholic um, uh, Irish. Uh, sort of origins and and were set up for similar reasons and and Belfast Celtic was set up with the aid of a of a of a donation from from Glasgow Celtic so you know there's still those things going on they're just yeah. not not um uh not to the sort of uh, extent or or severity that that they were in the the 70s and 80s where you had you have paramilitary organisations sort of, uh, you know, lobbing grenades into grounds, or you had yeah. little loyalist old ladies chucking the embers from from their still smoking fires <laughs> um, at, at, at people at, at people at, at fans of opposing clubs trying to enter yeah. the ground because the you know a lot of the grounds. Um, tend to be in quite densely packed sort of working class areas, so it was very easy for a little old lady to get a shovel and you know fling some coal, fling, fling some embers um, at some <laughs> Cliftonville fans, or or you know the other way around, depending on where it was. When you, you know, put it like that, Ben, it's, it all sounds like good, healthy fun. Well, yeah, I mean that that was was quite an uh, amusing uh, a tale to discover. <laughs> Probably not amusing if you were. Um, I know, imagine that on the other end of uh, the other end of it, although looking then looking across and seeing that some sort of septuagenarian had just uh, flung it at you was <laughs> something to talk about in the pub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what, 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 in your opinion, then, what do you, uh, what do you think the future holds uh, for the area and for football in Northern Ireland and, and indeed the Republic? Well, I, I think um, just to, I, I was going to just talk about the DUP and I realised that I ended up talking about a bunch of old ladies, basically. <laughs> but um, I hope that's so, not a, a, a clever joke. <laughs> um, so the, uh, I mean, you know, you asked about Brexit and, and the DUP and I honestly don't know what's going to happen with the Irish border and Brexit. I don't think anybody does. It seems mm. virtually impossible to... Uh, 
you know, to to have any sort of customs. Or well, for you... for any listeners who, who uh, sorry to interrupt, but for any listeners who who aren't aware of, of what's happened recently, Brexit. Of course, I think most people will know that what that is. You know, as a, through the result of a referendum, uh, Britain has decided, uh, or the UK has decided to secede from the European Union. But when we say uh, when we talk about the DUP, uh, after or not not too long after Brexit, a few months after Theresa May, who's the leader of the Conservative Party and the current Prime Minister, decided to hold. A, a snap election, uh, presumably, I think, under the illusion that she was going to win a much larger majority for the Conservative Party. What happened instead that, uh, was that uh, the Conservative Party actually lost a number of seats. Uh, the Labour Party won uh, won a number, and the Conservatives uh, were a few seats short of holding a majority within the Commons, which would mean that they were more easily able to pass uh, laws that they would see fit without, you know, the assistance of other parties. So uh, they looked around to to seek a deal from another party, and the DUP, who were the Democratic Unionist Party in Northern Ireland, uh, had eight seats at the time and were the only party around that were likely to form a partnership with the Conservatives. So now I think the problem in Northern Ireland, if I'm right in thinking, is that there's potentially a slight imbalance in power uh, between the DUP and Sinn Féin, who are the traditionally nationalist party. That's that's right, yeah. So the DUP, I think, actually went up to 10 seats. Um, uh, I think the Conservatives needed eight seats to, to get the majority, and the DUP have got 10, which... Um, so that makes them the largest party in Northern Ireland. Um, Sinn Féin also made up some ground. Uh, both both of them made up ground at, at the expense of smaller parties. Um, and uh, so, although Sinn Féin MPs don't take their seats, they so. don't. No, um, but but obviously, yeah, the the fact that those seats weren't taken, for example, by the SDLP, um, yeah. meant that. Um, you know, the, certain other permutations were were sort of um, uh, you know off the table in terms of any you know, say the Labour Party, mm-hmm. um, you know, was was within touching distance of of uh, of a majority. Um, uh, within that context, there's the Northern Irish descent, Northern Irish Assembly, um, which there was elections for even earlier um, in this year. Um, and which uh, uh, the DUP and Sinn Féin were, were again the largest parties there, but haven't right, been able yeah. to f- form a, a, a power sharing executive. Um, so there's been no devolved government effectively in in uh, in the Northern Irish Assembly um, since the end of January. Um, so um, it's difficult to see how that's going to move forward. Um, yeah, I, I think what what we're probably going to end up with is is a period of of a year, two years, maybe longer of direct rule of Northern Ireland from Westminster, um, and uh, and then in a sort of post Brexit scenario, perhaps the parties trying trying another election, and then the two parties probably, I mean, not probably, almost certainly being the same two parties again, but perhaps having an, another crack at it in a sort of post-Brexit context, um, because Sinn, Sinn Féin may believe that, uh, depending on what what sort of the economic realities that, that Brexit unleashes, that that um, that that uh, people might be more receptive to a, a united island or a vote on a united island. Yeah. Um, and the, in, obvious, the obvious issue there is that once Brexit goes through, uh, the Republic of Ireland remains part of the European Union. So the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland uh, will have to be m- theoretically more heavily policed than it currently is for reasons of, you know, customs and, and people coming across and, and, yeah. and leaving. Right. Which which would be I mean, I won't get into the weeds of this because it's literally the weeds because the border is in people's gardens in a lot of places there's like three <laughs> nearly 400 miles of border and sometimes it goes through people's houses so their yeah. their lounge is in northern ireland and their bathroom is in the republic of ireland i, I don't know if you've seen this video but there's a fantastic video of a, a farmer from northern ireland whose sheepdog uh, just runs across uh, and the farmer says oh he's just gone to visit the republic <laughs> and now he's come back to northern ireland and just the dog just is free to do whatever he wants I haven't seen that, no, but I'll, I'll check that out later. So mm. I honestly don't know what happened. I, I don't think there'll be a customs border or, or any sort of 
I, because it just can't work basically yeah. and, and it would give give um, any sort of dissident republican organization a, a pretext to to wage some sort of campaign um because you know it's very easy to to feel like there's no borders when when both countries are within the european union um but if there was something a physical manifestation of that and if it took you you know a little while to cross it you know there's there's tens if not hundreds of thousands of people who who work live on one side of the border and work on the other side of the border um so uh um, you know, the next few years could could be tricky. Um, it's a and, bit of a nightmare, basically. Yes, yes. Yeah. I think uh, everybody who thought that we could have a vote on Brexit and that it wouldn't happen just thought, well, we're never going to have to sort stuff like this out because it's never going to happen. Yeah. And yeah. it did. So. OK, well, let's talk about something a little bit less nightmarish. Uh, let's talk about you and your, your recent book, Gunshots and Goalposts, The Story of Northern Irish Football. Um, ben, if you would, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, why you decided to write the book. Um, so I um, was at a uh, symposium for the launch of another book about a year ago, um, and that was a book um, on uh, English football in 1966, uh, 1966 and all that. Um, and it you know, had various authors doing different chapters and and they were sort of took a chapter each and were talking about what the, the sort of social context of 1966 was, um, what else had been going on that year, what what England's um, triumph in, in that year meant to the country, you know, looking at it from this kind of holistic perspective. So, you know, within that book, there is like a, a, a match report as well. Um, so it's a, it's a football book, but it's, it's a, it's a book that goes beyond football. And, and I, uh, I, I kind of, um, thought, well, I wonder if anything has, has been written about, uh, Northern Ireland in in this way, and obviously within um, Northern Ireland, you don't have a a, a great tournament victory um, like the nineteen sixty six World Cup, um, but obviously you have certain contexts where where football and politics were were intertwined. Um, you know, you hardly have any contexts where they weren't. And I'm uh, although I uh, was born in England and speak with a very English accent, my uh, my sort of family tree on my dad's side is um, is all Irish, um, if you like. And uh, to please my gran, I should perhaps say Northern Irish. Um, uh, so you know, we could we go back a long way in in the northern part of Ireland. Um, so. Uh, um, so, so that was something that I that I started to take a look at, and you know, came across some some stories that I I wasn't familiar with. Um, you know, the nineteen twelve match between um, between Belfast Celtic and Nimfield, and and that in the context of of the uh, Ulster Covenant, uh, which was which was signed by about a quarter of a million men, and a similar document signed by a quarter of a million women. Uh, mm. A couple of weeks after that, Belfast Celtic um, v Linfield game. Now, actually, one of the the men that signed that was was my great grandfather. Um, so, uh, you know, I kept finding bits of bits of my own family line and family tree in yeah. in this um, in the in these tales, um, really, and you know. Some of the book touches on the links between the the great shipbuilding yards of Harland and Wolfe and Workman and Clark in Belfast, and they provided employment for 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 so many until the sort of sixties and seventies, um, and you know a lot of the the players that came up around then um, as well, and and my great grandfather um, uh, was employed there as well, so it was it was a sort of as well as delving into Northern Irish footballing history and Irish history, um, mm. it was it was diving into my own family tree. I came across a few a few old blokes who uh, <coughs> played for Northern Ireland in the thirties um, with wow. the surname Roberts that that can't be too distantly related to myself. So. <laughs> 
did you learn anything else interesting about about your family specifically when you were when you were doing this or i spoke to my uh, my grandmother who's still alive and uh, you know she said oh yeah you know i had, I had this uh, your, you know your great uncle whatever he had this son he played for Glen Torren for five years and you know, yeah. he was supposed to have this great career and you know he was a bit too fond of the drink and you know all these <laughs> stories coming out that you think well, why have you never told me this before um, but, um so yeah some some quite um quite sort of remarkable um family stuff coming out of it as well you know just he- hearing about the the first because my my dad was born in uh Lisburn which is a sort of fairly well-to-do um suburb of Belfast um and uh um but they you know they lived in and around there and then and then for a time in East Belfast and uh his his dad used to take him to uh to watch a, a team who were just a bit below the the top division uh, of the um Irish um league distillery um who played um in in a, a, a ground called Grosvenor Park in West Belfast, um, which uh, they don't play in any longer. They were bombed out of there during the Troubles, um, and they they do play in Lisbon now. But uh, um, you know, just hearing my dad tell tell that story and and trying to work out why why his dad took him up up the Falls Road, which you know my dad's dad was a was a, a Protestant vicar, so. You you wonder what, but then you know it was the early sixties, and although that was not um, not a, a sort of normal time, it was it was a slightly more innocent time than than the mm. late sixties. So, mm. and would you like to tell listeners uh, where they can find and uh, and buy and read uh, several copies of your book, buy it for all their family members and everyone they know? Yeah, um, you can get it through uh, the usual sort of places that you might get a book online. So uh, Amazon, there's a Kindle version um, and you can buy the paperback from various sources on Amazon, including a, a seller who's selling it for more cheaply than I am at the moment. So, <laughs> um, Do you have anything else you'd like to shamelessly promote, Ben? Uh, I... Uh, I... I don't know your Twitter handle. Do oh, my Twitter handle. Yeah, it's, uh, at it's not shameless at all. I was just joking. But sorry, <laughs> go on. Say it again because I've talked over you now. Okay, uh, so um, uh, the Twitter handle is at Benjamarkar, which is uh, at B E N J A Mark R, um, and uh, the Facebook page for the book is facebook dot com forward slash gunshots and goalposts, um, and you can. Also get hold of the book through my uh, own website, uh, the publisher website, which is polyfootmedia.com, P-O-L-I footmedia.com. And if you do want to buy multiple copies, um, perhaps as stocking fillers, um, that's the best place to get hold of multiple copies for as cheap as possible. Hey, isn't Christmas coming up? Well, you know. Look at that. <laughs> Who knew? Who who knew to release a book around this time of year? <laughs> it was actually supposed to come out in the person. spring. It was supposed oh, to come sure. out in March, but I hadn't written it sure enough it of it. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ben Roberts, thank you very much for your time, and uh, hopefully we'll speak to you again in the future. Thanks, Joe.